Okay, so for our viewers just tuning in, we are currently making careful moves towards a debris field which is nearby to um, a wreck of the Japanese Imperial Navy aircraft carrier Kaga. Um, we are, as you can see, um, it is a careful movement because we're currently diving only with our, um, with Atalanta, which is, um, normally we would do a two-body system with Atalanta on top and Hercules at the bottom. But we're currently at 5,400 meters or about three miles underwater, and that is uh, far below what Hercules is um, rated for or where uh, Hercules is able to go. So as we uh, make our moves towards the debris field, um, Hans or Mike or maybe anyone on shore, is this uh, quite a large um, piece of debris or is there, what might we, or what are you expecting us to see? Hey, yeah, I'm not really sure. Uh, I don't have an expectation because I'm really not sure what this consists of. It's, uh, it's not a debris field, it's a single debris but it's a piece of debris but it's it's large so it's probably some uh, section of hull plating that fell off um, and maybe it drifted with with current or something in a different direction than the than the ship uh, but we'll see we're about halfway there um, so it's taken about 25 minutes so yeah it just it'll take some time but uh, we'll get there pretty soon and we'll check it out okay thanks mike and sorry i do stand corrected it is not a field of debris it is a single piece of um intact debris Looks like we've got some debris coming in.
Can we get a zoom on that object? Yeah, I have no idea what that is. Yeah. Unidentified metal debris. All right, thanks. Well, we are more than halfway to this debris piece, chunk, thing. We'll see what it is, and then come back. It's probably like a section of hall, but it's, it's large. Uh, Nav, what, um, how, what total length of moves have we put in? We've put in a total of 80 okay. meters moves, yeah. Yeah, let's, um, let's, We're sorry, go ahead. Let's let the ship settle out and yeah. then maybe do the last t bit in like five or 10 meter moves. Okay, roger. We might even be able to see it after 80 and then just do little adjustments. And just jumping in back with a question from the chat. Um, we had a viewer interested uh, about the things living on the wreck. So wondering if our biologist, Upashana, could you comment on um, what you've seen on this wreck so far? Has it been different from the other wrecks or mostly pretty similar stuff like anemones? Yeah, we haven't seen much uh, of anything other than the anemones. And we saw just now a tinafor in the water column and earlier a sea cucumber, but it has mostly been in enemies and we have been seeing the same in enemies in the previous two wrecks as well. Uh, so I wouldn't say it's much different, but uh, given the density of the enemies, I am unable to comment because I haven't seen the entirety of the ship to compare. All right. Thank you for that uh, biological update.
And question for the ROV team, if possible, if this is a good time. Um, we had a question about the cameras. So um, what kind of um, operational, uh, I guess, limits are there on the camera? Um, for example, with the pressure, are these like custom made cameras that um, we have just made for the Hercules or um, are there cameras that are able to s withstand such pressures commercially? Sorry, what was the question? Um, the question was about cameras. So um, they're asking about um, the kind of cameras on Hercules. Um, are they like uh, custom made specifically for the ROV? Are they are like uh, commercially available cameras able to withstand the pressures and temperatures we're at? Uh, the answer is yes to both questions. And uh, you can get all the technical goo on our website under uh, lists all the uh, cameras and equipment that's on uh, Hercules and Atlanta and here in the control van. Uh, but the short answer is uh, the main camera on Hercules is made by a company called Insight Pacific and that was a very custom camera. There was uh, roughly half a dozen of them made around the turn of the century. 20-year-old camera, and uh, there has never been another one like it made. There's been many attempts, and uh, in my personal experience, I've never uh, never seen anything that can come close to it. The thing is huge. We use a five-gallon bucket for a camera cover. For uh, it has a specially ground diopter in it to correct for the uh, glass, air, glass, water interface. So there's no um, uh, vignette around the edge of the image like you would get looking through a window. And uh, yeah, it's titanium, uh, specially ground lens as well uh, for the glass, for the window. Uh, hemi, uh, hemi, half hemispherical dome with a very proprietary ceiling scheme that was developed by Insight Pacific in the 90s. There's uh, a couple other contenders out there now. Um, Deep Sea Power and Light is, um, or I think they've changed their name to Deep Sea now have manufactured a similar camera for uh, the Monterey Bay Research Aquarium Institute. The uh, jury's still out on what the image quality of that is. Obviously, it has a better or a more modern uh, sensor in the housing. Uh, our, hous our sensor was upgraded, so I don't know, maybe 10 years ago when, the, when we went from a three-chip or composite video to high definition video, so it's you know digital video. But yeah, it's probably uh, three feet long and twelve inches in diameter. Uh, the camera that's uh -huh. currently on Atlanta is uh, a mini version of that, so it's probably about. Uh, four to six inches in diameter and a little over a foot long. Wow, I had no idea the cameras were <laughs> so huge. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Careful, I could talk about ROV cameras all night until you're sleeping back there. Can we, speaking of cameras, could we pan up, see if this, if this thing's in sight? Roger. 20 meters away, so. Not quite.
It's like uh, possibly whatever we're following here, maybe coming out of a seabed, so we're getting close. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> totally. <laughs> And Mike, just to confirm for our viewers, we are uh, moving away from the vessel a little bit to look at a large piece of debris. Is that correct? Yep. Yeah, we're. Uh, it's about 100 meters um, off the starboard of the wreck, so we're we're almost there, about 20 meters away. Uh, this wasn't, as far as we know, this wasn't looked at before, so we're very curious to see if it's a piece of the hull or the flight deck or or what it might be. Gotcha. Thanks. And if you're following along, um, there's a, a few different camera views, including the quad cam that shows uh, the sonar image that our pilots are navigating by as well. So if you want to check that out, um, that's available both on our YouTube stream and on NautilusLive.org. And just wanted to say, Dan, thanks so much for the camera explanation. We have a very grateful viewer who um, said that uh, you should start a podcast. So <laughs> they would love to listen more about your uh, ROV thoughts uh, all day long. <laughs> sure, Jeanette, thank you. <laughs> ROV camera podcast hosted by Dan. Is that an anchor right there? Uh, can we zoom in on it? I don't, I don't. I don't think so. I mean, it isn't it isn't a sh anchor like shape, but I don't. Yeah, just a yeah, similar shape. Yeah. But it's pointing us to the right direction. Yep, it's an arrow. Yeah. That's uh, 10 meter divisions on the sonar now. Okay, thanks. Nav, how are we looking with our moves? We're looking good. Um, yeah, we're doing good. Uh, okay. Uh, how far are we? So we put in another 20 meter moves at 0132. Um, we're approximately. I would say between 15 and 18 meters away is my guess from what where the distance you said for the rough estimate. You mean. Um, are we moving right now? Yes, we're moving right now. Okay. So 10 minutes ago. Yeah, I mean, the, sh the ship is 
not moving, but we're Adelant is catching up. Okay. Do we know um, if this is like a trail that we're looking at or um, more debris in this kind of oh, long there it is. line? It, yeah, I mean, it's it. we're not really sure what it is yet. It, it could be some cables draping off of it, but that's the object right there. Okay, thanks. Is it possible it's a degaussing cable? I know we talked about degaussing cables uh, when we were visiting the USS Yorktown. Um, is that something we would see here, potentially? Those are usually pretty firmly attached to the hull lower down. So I wouldn't expect them on some debris, possibly from the upper deck, separated from the wreck. Okay, good to know. And um, could you um, help explain what the Gaussian cable is again? I kind of have a vague idea, but I, I think I'll get it wrong if I try. I'd be glad to. The Gaussian cables were thick electrical cables that were wrapped around warships of this era, firmly attached to the exterior of the hull, generally low down, but not beneath the water line and they could be charged, electrically charged, periodically to help reduce the magnetic signature of the ship. And there are plenty of reasons to do that given things like mines and, and, and uh, torpedo, magnetic torpedo detonators, etc. Hey, thanks for that reminder, yeah. So to um, uh, prevent the electrical signal of the ship from being detected, right? The magnetic signature. Magnetic, sorry. Whatever it is, it's uh, 20 meters tall. Yeah, it looks decently tall from the sonar. Yeah, so I just came up to altitude at 20 meters there and still lighting up the... Uh, yeah. Whatever it is in the haze back there. Can we maybe do a five meter move forward? Uh, yeah. Stand by me. Sure. We're still swinging in, Mike. Yeah, we're still, Adelante is still swinging. Yeah, I was thinking the same. It's not cable. <laughs> <laughs>
piece of metal. So my uh, kind of grand plan is to uh, keep coming up as we swing into it here. Yeah, that sounds good. It's obviously further away, up higher I go, so. Interesting. Um, little seabed has been disturbed there. Yeah. Bacterial mats all around it, too. Do you have an idea what this is, Mike? Um, my guess is that it's a a bit of a some of the upper decks that um, may have been holding on by a couple of threads, and yeah, as yeah. it rolled over and sank, it it fell off. Um, I thought that I might have seen a gun when he uh, when you guys went up a cup like 20 meters. There seemed to be some sort of shadow that looked gun-like. It could be one of the anti-aircraft guns, maybe. Um, it's definitely sections of hull plating, and I think these are uh, upper decks. And it makes sense that, you know, maybe they weren't all blown off, but this one was hanging on yeah. when, it, when it rolled over. From all the damage, yeah. Yeah. You know how, like, if you take a, a relatively thin piece of metal and bend it and bend it and bend it, it'll eventually break? Yeah. It's like that. It could be deck, but there could also be some of that, you know, the whole structure from the, you know, the hangar levels and those decks below it. Yeah. Um, there is something idea. that looks like you did a cap off. Judging John's idea. on and he's, uh, it is upside down. I think I agree with John. Oh, yeah. I hadn't thought about that. That's a good point. Judging by the disturbance on the seabed there, it's possible this landed first. And then and rolled. Then it, well, then it was drugged. So yeah. the, all the uh, lighter colored clay there you see is yeah. typical of what we find underneath the sediment. OK, that piece there, I think, is what I thought looked like a gun in, this, in the silhouette. So that's not what that is. John's comment is catwalks buried in mud, in the mud. Yeah, I see that. OK, you have the option of moving closer or moving laterally there. I think we're. Uh, I think I think it we're, we're, it's a good spot here. I think if we want to move to the right, there's going to I think we're I'm pointing to Hans. I think we want to move to the right uh, la laterally. Yeah, so it continues to our left for maybe 20, 30 meters and to our right. Let's change the heading here and see if it quite a ways. Might have to range up the sonar. I, I, I don't know. I haven't got there, gone there yet. So uh, we're still getting returns, uh, 40 meters at, on that heading, which is uh, 110. Is this due north that way? Uh, no, this is 110. The red. Oh, sorry. I was looking at Herc again. I keep yeah, doing that. <laughs> I do too. <laughs> I'm like, oh, cool. We're headed directly north. Nope, that's Herc, which isn't headed directly north either. No. Anyway, um, OK. Southerly. Northerly. Um, I want to go like, I want to stay on this side of it, I think. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think we should lateral to the right. Okay. Let's try a 10 meter move at one zero zero. Correct. Yeah, so everyone watching on shore side, um, 
there, there's a little bit to the left, and that, but there's a larger section that goes to the right. So we're gonna track this to the right, uh, look it over a little bit, uh, probably not spend too much time here, and then um, we'll, we'll go back to the, to the main wreck. I just wanted to get to this while we were on the starboard side, so it was easier to, to pop over than, rather than having to move the ship in multiple directions. Um, so we'll just do a little bit of movement here and then get back. No, thanks, Mike. We, we all concur here. That's good. Yeah, you don't want to leave something like this un, undocumented. Yeah, folks shoreside will be getting a shift change here also, so there'll be a, a brief pause. That'll be good while we uh, get set up further on the wreck. Yeah, but you're right on the money. Copy that. Um, one, one thing you might want to hand over before this disappears is uh, whatever that move is going to be to get back. So All be right. conservative. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in um, so far. To get home. The 12 to 4 shift is um, signing off, and um, the new watch is coming in. So as we transition, uh, there may be an interruption in the chat. But again, just thank you all for your questions, your messages. All our viewers from around the world, you, we appreciate you um, joining us in this exploration of this very historic, uh, important, and meaningful site. Uh, we'll continue looking forward to um, you joining on our dives. Um, for the next several uh, couple weeks of the Ala Al Moana Kayuli expedition. Thank you. Thank you, watch. Thank you, everyone. It's been a pleasure. I'm going to be handing off NAV to Derek. Um, and again, I just want to reiterate, it's been a pleasure to be in this, these reverent spaces, um, you know, to celebrate or remember both the Japanese and, and the U.S. personnel who were killed during this, this battle. That's the uh, ROV team signing off for watch change. Thank you very much. It's uh, grateful to be here. It's been uh, a pleasure and an adventure today.
All right, hello everyone. Can y'all hear me okay in the van? Awesome. Um, so this is Tori. Uh, the four to eight watch just got in here and is settling in. So I'm gonna give everyone a moment to kind of get to their areas and get all plugged in. But I just wanted to say that uh, it's just so amazing to just sit down and take a look at some of the messages that we're receiving from our viewers and just so many thank yous and so many messages of people sharing just how grateful they are that they get to watch and experience this dive with us. Uh, this is incredible what we're seeing now and I just, um, it feels so good to know that we have people that are watching along with us and sending in questions and um, I appreciate all these comments that y'all are leaving and I see a lot of people also thanking uh, folks in the control van for all of their knowledge that they're sharing, our ROV pilots, and also just saying that for some people this may be the very first time that they're really learning about this battle or learning about this place. So keep the questions coming. Um, and again, this is Tori. I'm one of our science communicators and I'll just pass it around the van as we settle in for our four to eight watch to just briefly introduce who we are. So Malia, would you like to just go next? Aloha. Mm -hmm. Konnichiwa. Um, hello to everybody who's joining us from whatever part of the world. You are joining us live at nautiluslive.org. Um, we're just happy to be here. Um, we've been down on the seafloor um, since about 3.30, 4 o'clock this, this morning. morning. Yeah. Um, having the wonderful privilege and opportunity to um, check out the Imperial Japanese Navy aircraft carrier Kaga. So um, welcome to all of you. My name is Malia Evans. Um, I am a outreach and education coordinator for the Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument. My job on board is resource monitor and educator. Um, my background is in um, applied archaeology and ethnography. I'm just so happy to be here and, and being able to view this um, historic, really historic um, shipwrecks from the Battle of Midway. So I will pass it on to Hannah. Set one, set two, set three, recorder one, recorder two, recorder three, Hi. recorder four. I'm Hi, I'm Hannah Parody. I am, this is my first time on the Nautilus. I am part of the science and data team, and I'm a master's student in geology at California State University, Long Beach. Nice, thank you, Hannah. Thanks. And we've still got Mike and Hans in the van with us now, and I know that our viewers are maybe familiar with hearing their voices, because I don't know if y'all taking a break today. Nope, no break. No? <laughs> No break. 24-hour dive. Let's go. Oh Mike, goodness. would you like to make a move now? Uh, yeah, I think we can do 10 meters, um, whatever, like 135. Yeah. Looks like we're doing 100 before. Is that working out well? What? Looks like we're doing bearing 100 before. Well, we're on a different wreck now, really. We're on a different uh, thing. No, I mean the, the very last move that we just did. Oh, I didn't know she did another move. Yeah. Um... Well, no, because we're at a good distance away from the wreck. I'd go, I'd go fully uh, 90 degrees from where we're from our heading. So like, yeah, that's, one, that's right. 120. We, we came out at 45, roughly. Let's see. Let's see. We came. We're full wide, Jake. Yeah, 45. Yeah, it came out at 45, so. <clears throat> 135? We, no, we came out at a 45 degree angle to this wreckage site. Yeah. I think I think the 110 was to get us slightly closer. So, because we, we, we weren't, it's not square on. So maybe, um, maybe do like 120 or something. Okay. Well, looks, like this, looks like in the sonar it goes 90 degrees off this way, so yeah, 90 from our heading. Yeah, 45 would be 135-ish. Okay. 
135. Sounds good. 10 meters or how so far? Mike. Yeah, go ahead. John Parshall is just sitting in. You know, given the size of this piece that we're on, guess is that this is the forward hangar deck upper level. Yep, I see that. Bridge nav. I'd like to do a 10 meter move at bearing 135. Thank you. Sebastian, would you like to introduce yourself and your role here on our 4 to 8 watch? Yeah, of course. Yeah, um, cool. I'm Sebastian Martinez. I'm an undergraduate researcher at University of Hawaii at Manila. Um, I am currently studying deep sea environments, particularly those on seamounts. Um, I'm very happy to be here during this historic moment and to take a look at the biology and having these wrecks. Awesome, thanks Sebastian. Um, anyone in our front row ready or able to do just a quick little introduction? Oh, sure I can go. This is Derek Sowers, I'm serving as a navigator for this watch and I work for the Ocean Exploration Trust as a mapping operations manager. Nice, thanks Derek. This is uh, Jake Bonney, I'm an RV pilot and currently operating Atalanta. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Hans pulled up a, uh, a schematic and is looking at the uh, the forward upper hangar deck and yeah, looks potentially right. I think I saw the smaller gun platforms, but, you know, we'll, we'll continue to learn more as we study this piece. Well, what's interesting, so John was talking about um, a sketch that he did uh, for his book that showed uh, the forward hangar structure still there. And uh, if this fell off when it was sinking, then that would have been accurate, that it was part of it was still there before it sank. There is a lot of other debris off the bow, like a ways off the bow. So there was a lot that was, I think, on the wreck that had broken off but was still on it um, and that fell off while it was sinking. So what we're looking at on the wreck, the main body of the wreck is not what it would have looked like right before it sank. Um, we're looking at a debris field kind of separate from the main wreck site, is that correct? Uh, it's really just one section of the of the ship that broke oh, off, okay. uh, not really a debris field. That's off, off the bow and 
we're probably not going to get to that this dive because mm -hmm. it, it's a ways off the bow mm -hmm. and quite scattered. And I think I missed it. Did y'all figure out what this part of the ship is that we're looking at that's separated? There's a hypothesis that there, huh, a <laughs> hypothesis that it's um, part of the forward hangar deck that mm -hmm. would have been right below the uh, the flight deck uh, over the bow. Do you want to keep the sonar at 20, or are you happy with that range? I can range it down. 10 meter. If that's what this is, then, you know, it's sort of similar to the Akagi's descent through the water, where that forward flight deck on the Akagi may have been damaged during yeah. the battle and partially attached on the way down and fell off on impact. <clears throat> then this forward hangar section could have fallen off earlier yeah. and settled a little distance away. Yeah, it's weird that this settled where it did and the rest of the debris field of smaller pieces ended up in a completely different area. That I can't quite get my head around. Yeah. One hypothesis would be that the, uh, the Kaga was torpedoed in a slightly different area, shed a lot of debris, moved just a little bit, began the descent, and then lost this yeah. structure yeah, that's a good on idea. the way down. Yeah. So that the debris field's actually from the torpedo strikes and the rest of yeah, it fell yeah. off later. I mean, it could have been that she kited over bow first, but the bow is pointing at the debris field. Yeah, so probably not. Thinking of trying to pull us over another 10 meters towards yeah. that. Yeah, that sounds good. Same bearing, uh, okay. 135. Bridge, nap. Can we please do a ship move 10 meters, bearing 135? Thank you.
Tito, I love how many uh, folks you always have like listening in and watching along with us while we're on watch. And it kind of had me thinking about how all of us are staying connected to family and friends while we're out here. Um, and then I just started thinking about what um, it was like for uh, the sailors and the airmen, like the service members during this time and uh, how often they were able to communicate home with family and uh, just how grateful I am that even while I'm out here and kind of away that I'm still able to communicate with um, my family and kind of keep them updated. But I just want to honor too that that's part of like the sacrifice of them serving and coming out and being so far away. That's a good point, Tori. When you think about what were those modes of communication, mm -hmm. you know, in 1942, how were um, airmen and sailors communicating with their families? Mm -hmm. I suspect maybe it was by letter. Mm -hmm. I think that was probably the most popular form of communication then, or accessible maybe. Yeah. I think so, and Tito, I'm sorry, I think I was hearing you start to talk about uh, just modern technology and what we have now. I think you're on this. Back when I first started doing this, uh, all we got was snail mail, mm. and that would be so important to get once you got into port, and everybody focused on that so much, but, you know, being able to say hi to friends and family over this feed, like Josh and Caleb, was just so nice. Yeah, definitely. I know I have uh, my parents uh, just kind of let me know that they were watching too, but I even think back to, um, like, my dad was in the Army, and when he would be deployed, I'd be able to, like, email with him, and eventually, you know, we kind of had, like, Skyping capabilities, but I just remember mostly, like, email when I was, like, a lot younger, sending, like, letters and handwritten stuff like that, but... Um, yeah, do any of our uh, archaeologists either here or on shore just have some, I don't know, context about uh, communication with family? Would it have been by like letter at this point, mostly? Yeah, it would have been uh, by letter. My grandfather was actually on a destroyer during, in the South Pacific during World War II, and, uh, and when he passed, we, had, we found a whole bunch of letters mm -hmm. that he wrote. Um, they were very... You know, they were just back home with very few details. Like mm -hmm. my brother wanted to maybe write a, a story or a novel based on them. Like with mm -hmm. that, as a, but the, he said there, you couldn't send any details about what you were doing because it was mm -hmm. a security, like national security reason. So he said there really wasn't any, any detail in there for that. But it was mm -hmm. still nice to see that he had written a lot of the letters back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is Tito again. When I was on the battleship Iowa, it was the same thing. We could once, once in a while, they'd do a phone patch but you couldn't say what ocean you were in or location or anything like that. Mm. Yeah, my dad was in um, World War II, but he was actually in China during this time in the U.S. Army in Chongqing, which was kind of the, um, the headquarters for the, the army there. Mm. And I know that pretty much it was just letter writing, you know, that's how he communicated with his family. And I kind of have it in my head that these letters that were being sent out were uh, being like read over by someone else before it was able to just like go out into the public and just make sure certain stuff was like kept from being sent out for security reasons or... Hmm, I'm not sure if there was some kind of censorship mm -hmm. um, regarding that. Yeah, I'm not sure. I, th I think there very well could be military censors. I know that Hawaii during the war years was under martial law. And initially, you know, you can understand why, although I think of any territory or state in the United States, Hawaiian islands were kept under martial law the longest. Mm -hmm. And there's been some comment by historians about exactly the reason why that was. But there were censors as well, reading mail in Hawaii. I can't tell. Do we think
think we're seeing oh, the majority this? of this debris, or do you think it keeps going? Well, this, um, I'm wondering if this is some of the uh, openings that were, uh, gosh. I saw, I'm just trying to figure out where these, like those windows were, or those doors. Yeah, they might, they might be hangar doors. It might be these here, Hans. Yeah. Um, like right behind where the, the island was, um, right. kind of a, a halfway down the hall, there's there's doors like that, hangar doors. Interior hangar to John, he says. It looks like there are hangar doors to the upper hangar and hangar doors to the lower hangar as well at the boat deck level. But if we're looking at, at the forward piece, then we would be talking about the doors to the upper hangar forward yeah, over the island. Yeah, that's true. That could be what that is. And there's this big gap which would have been above that, a much larger window. But were they hangar doors? Well, he says they're not hangar doors because those, hangers. Yeah, those yeah. are closed. All right. So, you know, there was a space between the side of the ship and the hangar for yeah. different compartments and storage. And these could be openings into that those compartments, but not directly into the hangar itself. OK. I have one cross section. That I don't know how accurate it is, but it gives us a little bit of an idea. See that yeah. space? Oh, okay, yeah. I can uh, get a shot of, looks like there's a hatch and maybe even some biology for you, Sebastian, down in that one nearest us, if you want. Okay with that, Jake? Yep, go for zoom. Let me know if you want me to pan or tilt down, Tilt please. down. Please. Tilt that down. kind of purplish item on the left. Maybe not. Yeah, you can see maybe the inside construction. If that inner wall is inside that door, then the inner wall would be the hangar wall. How about the smaller think, one? Think that's right, shore side. There. So John was saying those um, dark areas that we saw are actually ventilation grills. So that's not what this would be. Oh, okay, Roger. So scratch that. It's good to have collaboration and confirmation when you're right, and it's yeah. good to have collaboration and uh, <laughs> confirmation. Well, I'd like to be told it's r I'm wrong now rather than months <laughs> from now when I'm trying to write this up. Right. And uh, for what it's worth, the eight samples I took from the Yorktown imaging, this type of work cleans up very nicely, and you're able to get a lot of detail down in there in post-processing. So this could have been like op windows opening out onto the hangar deck from interior rather than looking exterior because um, John says that the hangar decks themselves are fully enclosed. So this might have been stuff that we can't see from external plans. Take a look at the picture that just downloaded uh, in the chat. Oh, my. Yeah, storage areas opening into the, those compartments that were outboard of the hangar itself. That's what we were thinking. Here, can we done partial cut again thank you can we put in another 10 meter move to get going because it'll take a little while to, to move on do you want to keep moving down this line yeah let's just do like one more and see where that gets us sure i think i think we've seen the majority of this uh but i just want to do one more to get there's like another little segment that juts out then we can head back okay roger that bridge now Can we do a move 10 meters, bearing 135, please? Thank you.
Derek, could you share a little bit about um, what these ship moves mean and like what it means when you're calling to the bridge and asking from them? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, so basically, uh, the big picture is that uh, obviously the ship's <laughs> on the surface above the wreck and mm -hmm. there's a cable all the way down from the back of the ship to the vehicle that we're looking at this imagery from. Um, and it's a huge amount of cable that's out. We're at a depth of 5,426 meters right now. Yeah, wow. um, so when we, when we move the ship a little bit, it's pulling that cable to a new position. Uh, and the ship makes that move within a couple minutes of calling it up to the bridge. Um, but then the motion that we just did, that tug on that line at the top, at the surface, takes a long time to kind of translate all the way down that uh, almost 5,500 meters of cable. So we typically see a lag of 10 to 15 to 20 minutes, depending on the size of the move. And then the vehicle kind of goes where we wanted it to go mm -hmm. uh, most of the time. Mm -hmm. so and I noticed that when you call to the bridge, you um, will say a number for a bearing. What does that mean? That's a compass direction. So. Um, Basically, our reference frame for all of these movements is your sort of typical compass rose mm -hmm. with zero at the top, uh, 90 degrees, you know, 90 to the right. Uh, so we all need to be speaking in the angle measurement, so we're all looking at the same reference frame for mm -hmm. what direction we're moving the ship. It just gets a little confusing sometimes when you're down looking at the imagery because that's not the... The orientation of the vessel, the wreck that we're looking at, right. is you know obviously different than just straight ahead, and um, so we kind of building a map slowly down here, of the the orientation of the ship to get ourselves oriented, like how it's lying on the seafloor, and we want to move relative to that with mm -hmm. the vehicle. Nice. Thank you for that explanation. That was really helpful. Sure. Yeah. Can I see? So yeah, Derek. Once we um finish this move we'll like let ourselves like hang so we're like not there's no momentum because we found two watches ago like right after your first watch that trying to reverse and go the other way while we were still like kind of drifting was real really hard yeah so we'll hang out for a bit then we'll, if you could i mean it's probably what three moves so like probably 30 meters back in the other the same way we came something right. like that and then yep. we'll try to take the uh to the 225 route back to uh Back to the wreck. Okay. And we can we'll go slow so we can we can still like look around and zoom in while we while we go. Yeah. I guess the other option is after a few minutes when things settle, we could take a bearing on. You want to hypotenuse it? <laughs> I thought that was a little bit riskier, but it would be a little faster. It's up to you. I mean, it's just a, it's just uh, another way to do it. It is another way to do it. I just uh, yeah. See there the, <laughs> the reason that I. I recommended the way that I do is because we were we had started to move away. We're like the ship had moved like 50 meters or something like that, and but we hadn't yet. And Jim was like, "Oh, that's torpedo damage." We're like, "Sorry, we're leaving already." Um, so we want to kind of the part the the spot that she marked in high pack is the kind of a specific spot that we want to take another look at. Okay. Yeah, we can certainly do that. Um, but I mean, if you, if you think that we that you can. I mean, we have it in high packs. So if you think a hypotenuse would work better, I'd rather undershoot, like get back to an area we've already seen, than overshoot. Right. Um, so, like, maybe get back to the wreck a little bit towards, like, after that point, and then we can continue to move down the the, the wreck. If that you think that'd be a little faster, we can do that. Okay. Yeah. Let's, let's think about it for the next five minutes. Yeah. Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> Calculate thank, that thank angle. You. Yeah. Nautilus Shore. Yeah, go ahead. So, Mike, the discussion here is, look, when we get back to the hull, that last spot we left before we came over to this piece, which is really diagnostic and, and good to have, have figured out, we thought what could have been torpedo damage, whether or not we can reacquire that or not, one of the most important things for us, we're thinking, is to complete the circuit of the hull. Ergo, from that spot to move then forward to the bow and, and take a look at that. Just um, in a text exchange with Daniel, he's indicating we have six more hours. 
yep. on the bottom. So, uh, if whatever gets us back the closest to that area of damage on the side of the hole where we departed from to come over here, yep, that, that is, would be yep, that is, bus. that is the plan. Uh, yep, as fast as we can, and uh, which is understandably going to be very slow still. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah. That, that's the plan. Get back to approximately where we left and saw that possible torpedo damage and then continue on to the bow. And I think we're going to get, we'll circumnavigate the bow and up the other side as best we can in, in the time we have. Right. The other thing we might have in the chat is that John's talking through this. I mean, that there was a small platform that would have been exterior. Uh, and again, just a reminder that the exterior wall of the superstructure is the wall of this as well. Yeah. Yeah, well, we're going to be sliding back along this hole. Well, maybe we're not, actually. Never mind. <laughs> um, yeah, but, Mike, I guess coming back to the point earlier with we're back in the hull, if this, we pretty much have a clear sense now of where this comes from on the hull. Yeah. You know, before it was detached. And then the question comes back to the little understood scuttling by the destroyers that think Gaga. Yep. And so if there's a torpedo hit or two torpedo hits midships, the blast it could have emanated up. And with that, you know, that would make it logical, I would suggest, that that would be part of what tore this off and made this easier to separate from the hull. Sure. Throwing it out there. Yeah, understood. Uh, I understood that we're we're going to let the, the vehicle settle here, and then we're going to uh, get back to the main wreck. Understood. And John also notes whether he saw the sort of perforated grating that indicated exterior platform. All right, yeah. I'm wondering, there's a hole here. Oh. That looks like damage. Yeah. Can you zoom on that hole there, Ed? Hey, can you circle? Uh, thank you. Um, are we moving to the right? Ready for zoom? No, yeah. we're, well, a little bit. Oh, yeah, that, uh, I think I'll tell you what you need to know once you get over there. You think that's a door? Uh, I thought mm -hmm. it might have been a bar bed of sorts, but it's not. It just looks like a hole. That looks like damage, whether it's yeah. something that you know, or something that came through. You can see how the plate bent up. Yeah. Now, right, yeah, you can zoom out. Thank you. While we're waiting here, I just wanted to elaborate a little bit on the uh, on the plan ahead. Uh, so the, the plan is to uh, basically continue uh, with uh, the full survey of the ship as best as we can. Uh, but the plan is to leave bottom at about 10 p.m. local time here in Hawaii. So that is about five and a half hours from now. Uh, it'll be about a three and a half hour to the surface, which would make it a 24 hour dive. Uh, so yeah, we'll, we'll have that, and um, after that, we are going to have about a 14-hour transit and uh, shift uh, operations to a slightly uh, different operational and thematic focus. So we'll uh, swap over to our Hercules vehicle and then uh, have several sea mounts to survey up at the northwestern end of the monument and then progressively working back. Um, so yeah, five and a half hours has been truly exceptional three dives here and really appreciate everybody's support. Thank you, Daniel. So 
Russ Matthews and John Parshall both have written in, and this is an appropriate time to reflect on something, and that is, as Russ writes, if, if this is the most major component of hangar deck we're likely to see, it's important that we pause and reflect upon the high rate of casualties that were sustained in these spaces, because what a 500-pound bomb does when it comes to an overhead into a fully enclosed space, think of the crew in here. That torn piece of metal is most likely indicative of exactly just how horrific that was. And so again, at every point on this, as we look at the aspects of what part is this, there are also is compelling evidence of what likely happened to the people. And again, a reminder as we do this, that as archeologists in particular, we focus on things to tell us about people. And this piece may very well be telling us something about what happened here. John, Russ, thank you for making that point. Are we thinking of moving further down this uh, debris structure, or do you want to take no, that I bearing think, back to the yeah, torpedo area? I think we've seen what we need to see here, so yeah, if we can uh, take that bearing and keep our fingers crossed. Yeah, I think we are pretty much settled out. That was a cumulative 30 meter of movement since yeah. we first showed up at this structure. Honestly, if you go like 210, you'll probably get there just fine. Oh, I see. The possible torpedo site was actually further further left than I thought. Um, yeah, yeah, but I don't. <clears throat> there was that. I don't know if you want to go that deep into the wreck, do you, or you want to no, stay more on the edge? Yeah, let's stay on the edge. So yeah, that that looks decent there. All right, maybe we'll do two three zero. Let's do yeah. eight, 80 meters at two three zero. Uh, let's do like sixty to start. And then we can do it in 10 increments. I don't want to overshoot. Okay. Not that we will, but, you know, momentum and stuff like that. All right. 60 meters, 230. Thank you. Yep. Bridge nav. We'd like to do a ship move. 60 meters, bearing 230. Yep. Thank you.
Yeah. Hans, I wanted to ask you a question. Um, from a historic preservation perspective, um, what would be kind of those, um, I guess, maybe best practices in regards to um, protecting these sites? Do you have any ideas or would we just leave it as is? Or like, what are some of those? I know it's so deep and so inaccessible, but do you have some ideas in regards to that? Yeah, thank you, Malia. Uh, sure, I think you're right. You know, these these amazing sites are protected by the depth of the ocean. And so, you know, very few uh, operations can access the deep ocean like this. And they're so far out to sea as well. We're very far from the nearest civilization that there's not a lot of activity overhead. But it's important to note that they're within the Papahanao Marine, Papahanao, <laughs> long day. Papahanao Mapuakea Marine National Monument. Sorry, it's been a long day. And within the expansion area of that monument and within an area that's undergoing consideration for designation as a marine sanctuary as well, right. which would give the area longer lasting protections. The reasons for that are not to try to preserve in situ these properties and uh, address deterioration, that's simply not pragmatic or practical. So in this case, when we talk about preservation of a site, what we mean is to prevent any inadvertent or intentional harm. Mm -hmm. If wrecks like this were shallower, we'd be talking about things like anchor damage, we'd be talking about things like uh, recreational divers who might be unaware and should not take artifacts from wrecks, of course, these are protected by the deep ocean. Mm -hmm. um, and also what we mean by preservation of sites like this is to maintain the information archive. So we're preserving the information, the digital images, the reports that will come out of this, the interpretation, uh, and to save that information for the public, that mm -hmm. type of preservation. These sites will slowly deteriorate over time in the ocean. Mm -hmm. So there, the expectation that preservation always means keeping something as it is now forever and ever is simply not practical. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it is possible to address our activities as humans and how we relate to the ocean. That's what we mean by no inadvertent or intentional damage. Mm -hmm. And Hans, isn't there a demand for steel like this that was was not exposed to any uh, uh, radioactive blasts? Yeah, that's a really interesting issue that has only come to light recently, uh, particularly for shipwrecks from the World War II period. Many were lost in the Western Pacific and in Southeast Asia, in uh, Indonesia, in the Philippines. And although quite often navies will establish sovereign immunity for their wrecks, for instance, in this case, the USS Yorktown remains the property of our US Navy, despite the fact that it's sunk to the bottom of the ocean. Destroyers and warships from the United States, from the UK, from the Netherlands, even though they're sunk in Southeast Asia, they remain the sovereign property of those nations. However, it's a big ocean and enforcement is difficult. So what's come to light recently is, and it's a, quite an interesting issue, four ships forged from steel prior to the explosions of atomic weapons and hydrogen bombs later that steel that was forged has a very, very low background radiation signature. 
We can't make steel like that anymore. The explosions and the tests were conducted. The importance of having steel with very low signature is when you are making medical equipment, for instance, and you're trying to detect uh, isotopes and low levels of radiation for human health, you need that steel. So that means it's commercially more valuable. And there are cases where uh, salvage operations have been operating in areas of the ocean and recovered vessels, sometimes entire warships from areas and taken them to the scrapyard for that steel in contravention of what those countries who, who have sovereign possession of those vessels want to see happen. It's a kind of an international issue, a complex issue. And I know that folks in Navy History and Heritage Command are aware of this in the UK and in the Netherlands. And um, I, I don't know that there's a solution yet to it. You're right, Tito, it's, it's quite an interesting problem. Yeah, I'm working with um, colleagues in the UK on, on some uh, leaking uh, oil tanker shipwrecks and kind of how different countries are addressing that pollution threat. And they have some, they have two uh, battleships off of Malaysia that uh, uh, recently they documented them as having been about halfway ripped off the seabed. And of course this includes all the sailors who were inside. Um, and they expect that by now, that was 2019, they expect that by now those wrecks are completely gone. And we're talking about the some. We're talking about ships this probably the size of Kaga that are completely ripped off the seabed. So in, in a lot of senses, these shipwrecks in deep water are much better protected from that sort of thing. But it's for another, it's for another, um, um, you know, it's another reason why we don't um, show the, the locations of the, of the wrecks that we're working on.
there's a conversation going on on the, the science chat now looking at this pillar, this pylon, this support. It's a very large support. Thank you, Mike, John, Jim. So this would be one of those um, supports holding up the extension in the reconstruction of, of the, the forward flight deck. Six pillars forward, four pillars aft. Yeah, I mean, you probably, probably can't read my scrappy writing. No, that's of course everything I just said was on uh, was <laughs> muted anyway, so right. this is completely irrelevant. <laughs> yeah, that was a fail. What's interesting is I don't know that. <laughs> These supports have the same uh, cross-sectional profile as the the kind of elongated tear-shaped supports on the Kaga. Different styles, I guess. Yeah. Well, if they were like, you know, well, oh, so that maybe they added these when it was in dry dock after the uh, after the Marshall Islands and when it missed um, Indian Ocean and uh, Coral Sea, they may have added some of those. Hmm. So John's saying that um, if it's a support, then we're looking at the juncture of the forward hangar deck with the anchor deck and it, the support would be the closest to the forward bulkhead of the hangar decks. I can see that kind of like right in here. I mean, I think that the the uh, hull plating structure uh, fits that, that forward part of the hangar deck as we were saying. I want to see a show of hands. How many people vote that we never do a dive like this again without John Parshko? Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> I don't see how it would be possible. We should have had John with us in the uh, in the sub with Harry when we were looking at I-400. I think it's amazing that we're we've been moving since I went went to the restroom and we're still looking at this. Because it takes that long for the ship movements to travel down to the vehicle. Right. Change of direction by the ship means a, uh, a delay for Atalanta. And there's that darkened biological mat, again, surrounding most all steel structures in the sediment. You're going to become a microbiologist by the end of this expedition. Well, I'm trying to turn Sebastian into a marine archaeologist. <laughs> you guys can switch. <laughs> Ow, there's some bar under the table here. Just look here, we didn't see any of those mounds around the main wreck, did we? No. No, the, the, the that disrupted area. Yeah, in disrupted areas, we don't see them. <laughs> Yeah, so that's making sense for what I said previously. So this uh, adds to it. You see? You're, you're halfway there, Sebastian. <laughs> when you're just looking at sort of like a pile of random uh, hull plates, you know, without sort of diagnostic things, it's kind of like, uh, but when you see things like this, it helps you really like, pinpoint and, and narrow down. So that's, for, for people watching online, that those are some of the things that we're really looking for, are these little 
little features in identif identifying uh, parts of the of the ship that we can uh, we can tease out of the, the wreck, which is truly a mess, um, and try to you know figure out. Then once we can can kind of place this section onto the ship's plans, then we can figure out maybe how it got here, what those uh, site formation processes were. Perfect, yes. Why it looks the way it does now to reconstruct the moment in the past. And still, there's a whole bunch of this ship that's somewhere else on the seabed, you know, somewhere around where the Nauticos group found um, parts of the, of the flight deck um, and that debris from, from the initial bombing. Yeah, and that could be a considerable distance away. Yeah. Just an update from navigation. We've moved about 25 meters out of that 60 meter move that we've already put in. Great, thanks. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> so it, yeah, the ship moved 25 meters before Atalanta moved at, at all. So now we're now we're off the uh, the, d the debris section there. Yeah, the, the pictures of Kaga that I'm used to are the ones before they built the flight deck out over the bow. Um, so that must have been like in the 30s. Yeah, that's the majority of the accessible ones that I've yeah, seen prior yeah. to reconstruction. I really love that. I think it's such a cool, I think the, the smokestack, the way it angles down off from under the flight deck is so cool. I don't know that it's all that effective. It just seems like a strange direction to angle smoke, but it's cool. <laughs> it's an interesting idea and concept. John says that Kaga was rebuilt in 1934, re-engined also to try to drag her slow poke self up to 28 knots. That was something else I was thinking about as we were transiting up here. The uh, the U.S. carriers each could, could max out at 33 knots, and, and Nautilus was going 11 knots to get up to uh, this area of Papahanaumokuakea. <laughs> I was like, these aircraft carriers are going three times faster than Nautilus's uh, transit speed. That's fast for a ship's that size. And how much bigger? Yeah, it's like that's the, the amount of power to move that amount that size ship. Thirty-three knots is incredible. I'm going to speculate that they used more fuel in a day that we're going to use on this cruise. I, yeah, they they must have had massive bunkers. So earlier, Mike and Hans, y'all were sharing about the shipwreck salvaging. Um, yeah. And I, that was something that I had never heard of before. So I really appreciate y'all talking about it and sharing it. I've been like doing a little bit of Googling. And I had learned from y'all previously about the uh, risk of pollution that some of these shipwrecks have like in the waters. Yeah. Uh, but we have a viewer that's curious about what other kind of stuff do maritime archeologists look at like besides shipwrecks in waters. 
Oh, well, that's an excellent question because <laughs> I, I wouldn't want people to get the idea that it's just shipwreck yeah. archaeology. Um, archaeologists in general look at sites that mm -hmm. have something to say about human behavior in the past, about human culture mm -hmm. in the past, and they do that with an eye towards what are the relevant lessons that we need to mm -hmm. learn today. Um, and one of the, you know, there are a lot of, people have always chosen to live by coasts, mm -hmm. and island people probably know this best, and that means that changes in coastlines uh, can lead to submerged habitation sites mm -hmm. and structures, um, and it's particularly important to understand that because we're looking at climatic impacts and climatic right. change that is eroding these areas more quickly. So um, anything like uh, aquaculture and uh, fish ponds that represent a living cultural heritage, particularly in places like um, the South Pacific today, mm -hmm. like Palau, you know, those, these are structures that are, have cultural importance and also archeological signatures. Mm -hmm. And their construction is something that's been passed on in a long time. And it's not just an, study that's important for academic interest. These right. are places that will be impacted in the near shore reef areas by climate change. There was an interesting case years ago when there was the tsunami that came in the South Pacific mm -hmm. and there was some damage in the territory of American Samoa on Tutuila Island. And an assessment was made afterward by archaeologists there looking at coastal and, and sites, recognizing 50-some sites that were impacted. And the thing about those coastal sites, those ancient Samoan sites, is those contain the records of uh, over 3,000 years. Wow. And that type of archaeology and the fauna and flora and remains found on archaeological sites like that give you information about the climatic regime mm -hmm. at that time. So it's a little bit ironic that the exact type of information we need to understand about climate has been damaged in certain areas of coastlines by okay. the tsunami. And I'm not saying that tsunami was the result of climatic mm -hmm. change per se, but increased storm frequency, increased coastal erosion, we know all those things uh, are coming. You were referring to the tsunami that hit American Samoa in September of 2009? That's right. Yeah, that, uh, uh, know a little bit about that. That that was actually caused by two uh, 8.0 earthquakes that happened simultaneously. Right. One triggering Jeez. the others that lifted the seafloor 10 meters. Oh my mm -hmm. God. That's right. Wow. So an earthquake, not climatic change, yeah. <laughs> but coastal impacts and what they mean. Yeah in terms yeah, of seriously. natural resources wow. and cultural resources. Let's change the video. That's, that's the topic. That's some earthquake. Jeez. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that insight, Hans. If I, may, if, if I may, in addition to this, and, and Hans, thank you, that, that's very you know, to the point and, and half a pro. The practice of archaeology has changed powerfully in the last while. And in the maritime world, uh, where it started, other than people looking to find sites of, you know, iconic important ships, let's find the Monitor, for example, or let's find this important ship. Um, it also was a question of let's find the oldest of this or the oldest of that. Most of that archaeology was done uh, in the same model that archaeology had been done in the Middle East and other countries by people coming from Britain or the United States doing that work. And what has evolved has been work being done in various countries by people in those countries. And it's shifting away from being a field that dominated not only by those countries, but also as being a largely older male field to being one in which diversity is truly represented. But it's also represented in the archeology span in regard to the types of ships that we now study. Admittedly, we're looking at an iconic warship along with other iconic warships, and that remains something of importance, particularly given 
the nature of this battle and these ships and what we've been talking about in regards to the people. But let's also remember that the majority of shipwrecks out there in the world are fishing vessels and the working craft. I mean, the perfect storm made a point to a number of people that we cared about that ship because a book was written about it and then a movie was made that reflected the reality for a number of people who for millennia humans have gone to sea because that is the source of their life. They, they, they need to fish to live. They need to work. They need to go to the job. And there's no guarantee that they get to come home. So when we work on the site of, say, a fishing vessel, we're speaking to something that is a very common aspect of the human story where archaeology can fill in detail. And in some of these cases, we don't have the, the same level of documentation as we have now as we're looking at Kaga where we can say, yes, this is wrong and this is wrong in a drawing, but we know so much more about this worship because it's built at an industrial time by a government and is documented. That's not to say that every bit of, of documentation is accurate or complete, but there are many vessels that simply speak to craft built by people in indigenous communities who are working on the waters, and that happens around the world. We also are looking at vessels that speak to other aspects in addition to war. We're looking at things that speak to exploitation of resources and the thousands of ships that were linked to the transatlantic slave trade. So archaeology seeks to be more inclusive in terms of the sites we look at, but also the way in which we look at the aspects of the human experience for better and for worse. And with that, again, a reminder that as much as we are looking here and saying this is this and this is that with the vessel, coming back to what I said earlier, we can't forget the human side of it. The only other comment I would make is as we've looked at Yorktown and Dakaki and Kaga, there are other vessels that are out there, but also in between those vessels and elsewhere on the seabed are the aircraft that went down. There are also pieces of ships that fell off in parts of the battle. And we've seen a very important and provocative piece that speaks to life and death uh, most recently just here right off of Kaga. Battlefields by themselves can tell a great deal. And I think for many of us who are working in the area of naval archaeology, it is that question of the submerged battlefield. There have been a few comments on the thread for Americans in particular, uh, a Gettysburg, for example, a battlefield that many tourists can walk over and see. This battlefield is 5,000 meters beneath the sea in the eternal darkness, and it's briefly lit up for our inspection and to share with the world. But that in no way means it is not as significant or as important as other places where we can reflect on the folly of our actions as human beings drawn to war, understanding there are times when war is necessary to stop certain things. But just the case, the same, a reminder of, of that aspect of our history. So archaeology increasingly is drawn to tell those stories as well. And in that, archaeology hopefully can do so by offering direct forensic evidence, as well as the opinions or the thoughts of historians or of people caught up in the times and in the emotions of the times. And so, having worked on ancient Roman wrecks and with Randy Sasaki and Jun Kimura on the wrecks from Kubala Khan's invasion of Japan in 1271 and other sites, this, the, the archaeology of war and war at sea is in and by itself a very powerful part of it. But let's not forget the fishing boats. Let's not forget the indigenous cultures. Let's not forget the vast landscapes that speak to ports actively working for centuries or millennia. And finally, let's not forget that everything we see was built by, used by, lived in, and potentially guided by human beings. Thank you, Jim. Yeah, wow, thank you so much. That was 
so incredible to listen to and I really appreciate that perspective. Um, and I will say like for me, this is one of the very first times that I've really been immersed in so much archeology span and it's been just so incredible to learn alongside of everyone. Um, and that really just gave me like so much perspective. Um, and I'm really glad that our viewers were able to hear that um, as we look at these shipwrecks and kind of have a bigger picture of this work and um, y'all's careers and kind of like why you're doing this and like what we learned. So thank you so much. And I'll say too, we have a viewer that just left a note also expressing just how much this has meant to them. And they said that this has easily been one of the most fascinating and edu educational experiences that they've ever had the pleasure to uh, follow along with and that they've been like glued to the computer watching and listening for several days now. And just what a gift it has been to be part of this and like listen with us. So this is just so special. Yeah, that's great to hear. Well, it's all going to be on the midterm, so. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we appreciate everybody's patience as we make slower than normal uh, maneuvers through this very deep water. So for everyone who's, who's been viewing, it's not, it's not been the, uh, the most exciting exploration as we've been very diligent and, um, you know, and careful in, in how we're maneuvering our, our single vehicle at, at such great depth. So thank you for sticking with us. Yeah. Well, patience has its rewards. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I'll mention one other area that's, you know, beginning to emerge because we're beginning to have the tools to be able to detect it. Mm -hmm. It's the Paleolithic shoreline, Paleo shorelines, and par even part of our national initiatives to map our own EEZ zones, our economic exclusive zones has as one of its priorities understanding those paleo coastlines because during the last glacial maximum on an order of 10,000 years ago or so, of course we had a lot of glaciers and ice mm -hmm. and uptake of all that water. So the world's oceans were you know, at various levels, but I think an average of something like 100 meters lower than they are today. And that, that number changes depending on where you are. And that means a lot of Paleolithic habitation sites, migration sites on coasts and along coasts are now submerged. These are pre, this is the pre-Iron Age though. And so the question is, how do you detect a site like that if one of your tools is side scan sonar or multi-beam sonar that's looking for straight lines and things and things that stand up above the seafloor or one of your tools is a magnetometer designed to detect concentrations of iron those aren't the right tools for that. But there is an awareness that there is potential off of many of our coasts and for some of these truly ancient habitation sites. So that's very interesting. And it's relatively new, I think, to our field. Would you say that, Mike? Yeah. Yeah. Nautilus, just really quickly, Jeff just spotted something. Does that look like a shell kicking up out of the mud? In the Here. Do you guys see that? Yeah, next to the white spot. Yeah, and another like like next to it, like a. What is that? Could be. It's like a point down, right? Yeah, but then look at the other. It looks like trash there, but that. That looks like a corner. That's a yeah. box. Yeah. Radio? It's a box. Is that a radio? Like a speaker? Um, don't know. Yeah, it's hard to tell. That could be some kind of shell point down. But, you know, in discussions with some of the um, archaeologists and conservationists yesterday, I've come to suspect white, these white corrosion patches of being aluminum. Yeah.
<laughs> so, hey, Hans, I was, when you were talking about that, I was thinking back to the discovery by the French. Uh, so, I didn't oh, realize yeah. I was muted. And for those you of you out there who don't know about this, Pasquier, come forward. on the French Mediterranean coast, a group of divers <laughs> will dive into the cave. No worries. And they swam up this cave, and all of a sudden they realized that their heads, their heads were sticking out of the water. And with that, they were in an, a drowned cave that had last been dry some 30,000, 36,000 years old. And what they could see were human footprints in the mud, and then they began to see animals painted, much like Lascaux or other great ancient caves. This is the cave that had once been on a coastline that had been drowned at the end of the ice age and was sea level rise. The, place where these people had lived had likely been on the plain now some 200 feet deep beneath the Mediterranean. And what the cave was, an earlier portion that had flooded may have also had art, but what remained inside this cave in the upper level was in its own way the cathedral of these ancient Ice Age people, animated in ways with animals conforming to the rock to give them a three-dimensional sense. Human handprints as sprayed with paint that somebody had sprayed through their mouth to create what potentially could have been the signature of the artist. 36,000 years ago, and then seal, when the sea came up and then stopped and remained there. So today there's a grating that keeps it from being disturbed. French archaeologists are studying it by entering it hooked underwater because the thought of trying to drill in to create an airlock to approach it might lead to its complete yeah, flooding and the destruction of all of this, which incidentally included still wet, pliable human footprints, yeah, hand good. marks from scrabbling up the muddy slopes, and the stubs of wooden torches from 36,000 years ago. Again, so archaeology has a great deal to yield, and in this case, something a discovery made by exploring divers, not archaeologists, who looked and did not touch and then reported it. That's, that's truly amazing, Jim. Thank you for that. And um, I just want to say for the record, I did not think that that cylindrical thing was a paint can. <laughs> so I just want to go on record. <laughs> yeah, that's a first. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to take a break and, yeah, and get some good. dinner. Yep, do that. Yeah, after listening to that story about the divers, I'm curious, is it common? for uh, maritime archaeologists to be scuba certified? And is that like part of something that you'll typically do in your career to dive and look at sites? Uh, well, yeah, but, oh, go ahead, Jim. Well, some of us are certified. Some of us have, you know, different levels of training, mm -hmm. but you don't need to dive to be a maritime archaeologist. Mm -hmm. There's a number of sites you can study and look at elsewhere. But with that, if I could, I just want to also say that you also can make discoveries and you can participate in projects and not be an archaeologist. Yeah. There's a number of very exceptionally trained divers and others who can do incredible work and have been part of some very key projects that a number of us have worked on. I think the most important, and there you have, you know, a perfect type of partnership. And I, when I think of that, it comes back to exactly with what we're doing now. Not everybody on this call and not everybody out there listening to us around the world is an archaeologist or is a professional historian. Mm -hmm. And you don't need to be. Yeah, There's a number of folks who are making important contributions, identifying things and speaking to this based on what they know. And that's powerful. And so, again, a reminder that we all can play a role in, in exploration. We can all play a role in talking about things like this. Yeah, and the most important thing with all of that is to have an open ear and to listen. So you're saying you did not get annoyed with all the emails